Christina Castiglione, 19, lived with her mother and father in Redford. She graduated from Redford Union High School and was active in sports, the release said. She was not married but had a steady boyfriend. She was employed by the Detroit Edison Company as a clerk in the research department and had contacted an Army recruiter prior to her disappearance. On March 21, 1983, Christina Castiglione was reported missing by her mother in Redford Township. On March 29, 1983, the Livingston County Sheriff's Office was alerted to a deceased body located in the Oak Grove State Game Area on Fawcett Road in Deerfield Township. Deputies responded and found the body of Christina Castiglione partially clothed and lying in a remote wooded area. Detectives found evidence that Christina had been strangled to death and sexually assaulted. During the autopsy, the medical examiner located male DNA sources that were collected and preserved. Lacking DNA technology in 1983, these samples were later entered into Cody's by the Michigan State Police Crime Lab in the early 2000s, but a suspect was never identified. For nearly 40 years, the Livingston County cold case team and detectives worked extensively on the case and pursued an exhaustive number of potential leads. In March of 2022, the office applied for and received grant funding through Season of Justice to conduct advanced DNA testing on the suspect DNA samples taken in 1983. Season of Justice is a non-profit organization dedicated to funding DNA testing on unsolved cold case homicides. They provide funding to law enforcement agencies nationwide to conduct advanced testing in homicide, sexual assault, and Jane-slash-John Doe cases where the victim's body or the suspect is unidentified, and DNA is the only investigative option. In May 2022, DNA evidence from the case was sent to Othram Incorporated, a private forensic laboratory in Texas. Othram scientists used forensic-grade genome sequencing to develop a comprehensive genealogical profile from the DNA of the unknown suspect, which returned leads to authorities. The investigation led to the identification of a suspect, Charles David Shaw. His identification was confirmed by three separate familial DNA comparison tests. Unfortunately, Shaw died in November of 1983 and will never be held responsible for his crime in a court of law. Detectives were unable to find any direct ties between Christina and Charles Shaw to suggest why she was targeted. However, through collaboration with living relatives of the killer, it was determined that he was a longtime Livonia resident who lived less than five miles from where Christina went missing. Based on information received from Shaw's family, he was described as a sex addict with a disturbing life who struggled with mental illness and his gender identity. Charles Shaw had several interactions with law enforcement beginning at a young age. One such interaction resulted in his arrest in 1981 for the attempted abduction of a woman in the Fowlerville McDonald's parking lot. The cooperation of the Shaw family during the investigation was paramount to identifying Charles Shaw as the person responsible for the homicide of Christina Castiglione. Sonia Carmen Stone, a single mother from Quebec, was strangled to death with her own pantyhose on October 15, 1981 in her Carmel home while her four-year-old daughter was at school. She was a sales representative at Levi Strauss, had a broken left ring fingernail with blood beneath it, which suggested she scratched her attacker. DNA found underneath the young mom's broken fingernail has led to the conviction of a neighbor 40 years later. Michael Glazebrook, 67, was found guilty of first-degree murder with enhancements for using a deadly weapon and for committing rape in the death of 30-year-old Sonia Carmen Herrickstone. The verdict comes 41 years after the former school bus driver was tried for the murder but not convicted after a jury was unable to reach a unanimous verdict. It's been a day that we've been waiting for, for a really long time, Herrick Stone's daughter Sasha Stone said after the verdict, KSBW reported. The case was reopened in 2020. The renewed investigation included forensic testing unavailable at the time of the original trial, according to the Monterey County District Attorney's Office. 
The testimony was that her back door was unlocked so we are presuming that is likely how he gained entry, Deputy District Attorney for Monterey County Matthew Leroux tells people. We didn't find any other signs of forced entry, and we don't think she would have let him in. Liuru says the attack happened right inside the front door. She still had her outer jacket and purse with her, he says. We think it was likely she was walking in the house when she was attacked. Glazebrook was 25 and married at the time and had recently moved into the home across the street just months earlier. He became a suspect immediately after a detective investigating the killing spotted a 3 to 4 inch vertical scratch down his right cheek. Initially, he said he was at his father's house and then, in 2021 when he was interviewed he said he was at school at the time of the murder, says Liaru. Glazebrook was taking college classes and worked as a carpenter at the time of the killing. Liaru says Herrickstone and Glazebrook did not know each other. None of her friends or neighbors could say they knew each other, he says. During this month's trial, California Department of Justice criminalists testified that DNA evidence found underneath Herrickstone's broken fingernail and her right breast linked Glazebrook to the crime. Liuru says in 1983, there was no DNA testing and all they could do was blood typing for genetic markers. I do think the DNA is what made the difference, he says. It was the strongest direct evidence we had linking him to the murder. The family just wanted to express our tremendous gratitude for this team, Stone said, according to KSBW. Sonia was a wonderful woman and we're so happy to see justice for her. Glazebrook is scheduled to be sentenced on April 26. In 1971, Rita Curran, a 24-year-old schoolteacher, was found strangled to death in her apartment in Vermont. The college town of Burlington, where Curran taught second grade, was devastated. Police interviewed Curran's neighbors, investigated hundreds of tips and collected evidence including a single cigarette but found near her arm, but were unable to name her killer. Curran's murder, unsolved for more than five decades, became one of Vermont's most notorious cold cases. That changed this week when police detectives announced the identity of her murderer, a male neighbor, police say, who later became a Buddhist monk and counter-cultural guru before dying of an overdose in 1986. DNA technology and genealogical research have linked the cigarette but found near Curran's body to William DeRoos, who lived upstairs in the same apartment block. Investigators interviewed DeRoos in the 1970s but ruled him out. Even though he's dead, and there won't be justice, it is a really positive outcome, C.C. Moore, a genealogical investigator at Virginia-based Parabon Nanolabs, said. Moore's research identified DeRoos. And it is a great illustration of how investigative genetic genealogy is resolving these cases that so many people have cared about for so many years. In the summer of 1971, Curran had recently moved into a shared apartment. She was working as a hotel maid and taking graduate courses at the University of Vermont while waiting for school to start. Around midnight on July 19, her housemates found her dead. She had been attacked, sexually assaulted and asphyxiated. DeRoos, who lived two floors above Curran with his then-wife, was not one of the investigation's 13 main suspects. His wife told police that they were home all night. Bundy, who was born in Burlington, was thought to have been in the area around the time Curran died. Shortly before his execution in 1989, however, he denied responsibility. Curran's death became known as Burlington's oldest cold case murder. In 2014, Burlington police decided to reprocess the evidence using modern technology. Male DNA was found on the cigarette found near Curran's body, but it did not match a national felon database or any of the 13 primary suspects. The Burlington police reopened the case, again, in 2019. Detectives sent the cigarette DNA to Parabon. It took more only a few hours to identify DeRoos.
At the top of the list were two people who shared enough DNA with the unknown suspect to be his first cousin once removed, Moore said, and those matches ended up being on both sides of his family tree. That's extremely unusual. It was shocking. Testing of DNA on Curran's housecoat confirmed the findings. When police re-interviewed Derus' ex-wife, she admitted to deceiving detectives. She said Derus, who had a criminal history, had persuaded her that she had to protect him from false incrimination. The couple had married two weeks earlier. I think she lied at the time because she was young, she was naive, she was newly married, she was in love, Thomas Chenette, a Burlington detective, told the press on Tuesday. In actuality, she and DeRousse had argued that night. DeRousse left the apartment and returned while she was asleep. He and his wife left Vermont soon afterward. They separated, and DeRousse moved to Thailand to become a Buddhist monk. A few years later he surfaced in California, where he remarried and was known as a countercultural guru called Dutch. Darus's second wife, from whom he also became estranged, told police that he had a violent temper and had once choked her and non-fatally stabbed a friend. About 15 years after Curran's death, he died of a drug overdose in a San Francisco hotel room. I don't think so much about the guy who did this as I do about Rita, and my parents and what they went through, Curran's brother, Tom Curran, recently told the press. In February 1973, Leslie Perlov was 21. She had graduated the previous year from Stanford and had been accepted to law school at the University of Pennsylvania. In the meantime, she was working in Santa Clara County's Law Library in Palo Alto. Leslie lived with her widowed mother, Florence Perlov, in Los Altos Hills, and had two younger siblings, 20-year-old Diane and 18-year-old Craig. Highly intelligent and ambitious, Leslie planned to become a lawyer. She had been offered a place at the University of Pennsylvania, and would have started her degree in the fall of 1973. On February 13, 1973, a Tuesday, she was last seen alive as she left work for the day around 3 p.m. It is speculated that, as she often did, she stopped on the way home to take a walk in the hills west of Stanford's campus. She was missing for three days before her car was found parked off Old Page Mill Road. Her body was not far off the road, for she had been strangled, apparently with her own scarf. In March 1974, Janet Taylor was 21. She had grown up in the Stanford area as the daughter of Chuck Taylor, the university's football coach, 1951-57, and athletic director, 1963-71. A graduate of Menlo Atherton High School, she was living in La Honda with a friend, attending Canada College and working in an office on Page Mill Road. On March 24, 1974, a Sunday, the housemaid dropped Taylor off at Stanford because her car wasn't working. She had dinner with friends at their home on Girona Road and left around 7 p.m., saying she intended to hitchhike home to La Honda, about 15 miles away. Her housemate was working that evening at the Miramar Beach Jazz Club Bach Dancing and Dynamite Society, and Taylor said someone needed to let their dogs out. The following morning, her body was found in a ditch three miles from Stanford University on Sand Hill Road and Manzanita Way by a milk truck driver. Like Leslie, Janet had been strangled. She had not been sexually assaulted and was mostly clothed, aside from her raincoat, shoes and belt which were later recovered by detectives discarded on Sand Hill Road. She had been carrying a purse, which was never found. Detectives were almost completely in the dark in this investigation. They believed there was a sexual motivation to the murder, even though Janet had not been sexually assaulted. Whoever had picked her up as she was hitchhiking had killed her, then discarded her belongings along Sand Hill Road as they drove away. Detectives had very few leads, and just as Leslie's case had, it was not long before Janet's also went cold. 
The public were convinced that Leslie and Janet were killed by the same person, even though detectives said there was no solid evidence to suggest this, everything they had was circumstantial. The cases went cold until the arrest of serial killer Ted Bundy, who was known to target young women. But after investigating, detectives concluded they couldn't find any evidence Bundy killed Taylor and Perlov. Now, 45 years later, San Mateo County officials say their initial hunch has been confirmed, they've arrested one man for both slayings. On Thursday, May 16, 2019, San Mateo County authorities announced they believe John Arthur Getru of Hayward, California, based on the DNA of his relatives, already in custody since November 2018 on suspicion of killing Perlov, has also been arrested in connection with Taylor's murder. The San Mateo County Sheriff's Office reopened the cases in 2017 and submitted DNA evidence from the original crime scenes. Investigators say a match was found for Getru, now 74, of Hayward. The Sheriff's Office says Getru has a long history of violence against women. In 1964, when he was 18, Getru was put on trial for a rape resulting in the death of a 16-year-old girl in Germany. He was convicted in 1975 of raping a Santa Clara County woman. Getru pleaded not guilty to both murders. He was due to stand trial in September 2020 for Janet's murder, but was hospitalized with a brain aneurysm right before his trial was set to begin. In November 2021, 77-year-old John Getru was sentenced to life in prison by San Mateo County Superior Court Judge Robert Foyles. He has been charged, but is yet to be tried for Leslie's murder. John pleaded guilty on Tuesday, January 10, 2023, to the 1973 murder of Leslie Marie Perlov, a 21-year-old law librarian on Stanford University land, the Santa Clara County District Attorney's Office said. John is sentenced to life in prison. Perlov and Taylor were not Getru's first victims. He was convicted in Germany of murdering and raping a 15-year-old girl, Margaret Williams, a decade before Perlov and Taylor were killed. He spent approximately six years of a 10-year sentence in a German prison for the crime. The fathers of Getru and Williams were stationed at a military base at the time and the two met at a dance. He lured her to a nearby field where the assault and killing took place, according to newspaper stories from that time. Getru has also been convicted of raping a 17-year-old Palo Alto resident, Diane Doe, in 1975. On April 13, 1984, 23-year-old Terry Lynn Kirkland was found beaten and stabbed to death near a Knoxville, Tennessee park. Her case remains unsolved. After just one month of forming a new unit, the Knoxville Police Department solved a murder case from 1984, according to officials with the department. Terry Lynn Kirkland was found beaten and stabbed to death on April 13, 1984 when a child made a horrific discovery in a Knoxville park. A little girl was playing, she lived next to the park, explained investigator Jeff Day with the Knoxville Police Department. Buck Tom's Park wasn't a large space, mostly woods mixed with slides and other playground equipment. She was laying face down, partially clothed, stabbed multiple times, it was a very brutal, sadistic killing, said Day. There were some other things done to her. Whoever killed her was very mad, very angry. The 23-year-old's death spurred fear among neighbors living nearby. It's not something you forget, a murder, said Day. People in that area talked about it, were scared about it. It was in a public park and was a pretty brutal murder. At the time, investigators conducted interviews, collected evidence, but no answers ever came. There was a knife next to the body, the handle had been broken off, the blade and handle was broken and it had blood all over it, described Day. Today, that small city park is pretty much non-existent, covered by woods, and the case is now in the hands of Detective Jeff Day. There is a good suspect, can't tell you who, said Day. 
He believes Kirkland's killer was no stranger. She was there with someone she knew, I would guarantee she knew them, said Day. The brutal nature of the crime leads him to suspect the close connection. The more violent an act is, it's more personal to them, explained Day. The person responsible, he believes, is likely alive today. The suspects in this case are in their 50s now and I imagine at that time, they were 20, 25 years old, said Day. Detective Day feels they are close to solving this murder. It might not take much more, it's like a puzzle, he explained. You need a certain number of pieces before you can prosecute a homicide case. The pieces are there but some we still need. I can see why a witness might be scared, that's understandable, maybe now they can come forward and feel safer now. Any tip we could get could prosecute this case, we are close. The Knoxville Police Department Investigations Bureau recently underwent several structural changes in an effort to improve the Bureau's collective response, effectiveness and efficiency, highlighted by the formation of the Homicide Unit. The newly formed homicide unit went into effect on February 26 and is responsible for investigating all homicides, suspicious deaths, suicides, non-fatal shootings with the victim and any assault in which the victim suffers potentially life-threatening injuries. Investigators with the new unit identified a suspect, who died in 2021. After the case findings were passed along to the District Attorney General's office, they determined there was enough evidence to prosecute the suspect and closed the case due to the death of the suspect. I appreciate Deputy Chief Coker and Captain Morrow for their forward thinking and championing this initiative, KPD Chief Paul Noel. With nearly 70% of our murder cases in 2023 effectively solved and the closure of a nearly 40-year-old unsolved case, the Homicide Unit has done an exceptional job of identifying suspects and working towards justice for victims and their families. Rest in peace to the victim and hopefully that gives some sort of closure to the victim's family. If you like the video, show your support and like, subscribe and make sure you click on the bell icon to stay tuned.